since I believed a ghost story. Haunted? Why, if the place had the ghost of a ghost in it, Uncle Tear would have ferreted it out long ago. He has already been three weeks in uninterrupted possession of this castle, and I should like to see the ghost that has escaped his vigilance for that space of time. Eh, well, it may be so. I have nothing to say against it, one way or the other. But this I know very well. Your true Highland ghost, he's just the perfect gentleman, wouldn't have dreaming of a turn upon me until you'd settled down comfortably in your new habitation. Why should these goblins choose our castle of all others? <laughs> yours? Why is name more yours than everybody's? The old castle's been uninhabited for the past four score and seven years, saved by ghosties and sick like, since the death of the great Dame Cherry Maybird, whose portrait hangs there. I know, the last on the left. Like every other possessor of the castle, when she died, there is ne'er a will or a title deed to be found. And the ghosties stepped in and folk wouldn't have had anything to do with such an uncanny place. So the castle remained uninhabited until your uncle, Sir Ebenezer Tear, of the firm or tear and Trent Alderman and Dallow Chandler, took it upon his head to try out the old maxim that possession is nine points of the law, and stormed in one broad morning, three weeks in, with Nera, with your leave, or by your leave, with no more rights to the place than the Sultan of Morocco himself. But no one is likely to disturb him. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. If there's any truth in the old legend about the wicked Dame Rachel de Bond, She sold herself to an awful, uncanny apparition on the 13th day of July, 1369, for right and title to the castle for 100 years. Dame Rachel was a sorceress who had a life interest in the castle, and nay more than a life interest. Being sorely pressed for silver and wishing to mortgage the castle after her husband abandoned her at the altar, she entered to a compact with the devil on the 13th July, 1369, but on Dame Rachel's death, no heir should be found to the castle until a century had slipped by. Well, she mortgaged the castle and spent the silver like the grace as soon as she was. <laughs> and she died and left ne'er an heir or a title deed. And ne'er an heir or title deed was found until the 13th of July, 1469, when Lady Montebu was born to tanks there, <laughs> came quite unexpectedly into possession of them after she found them in the drawers of a work table. While she took possession, died. Left ne'er an heir or a title deed, and ne'er an heir or a title deed was found until the 13th of July, 1569, when Sir Cecil Blount, the gentleman who hangs right over there, found them quite unexpectedly in a disused portmanteau on the 13th July, 1569. Well, he took possession, died. Left ne'er an heir or a title deed, and ne'er an heir or a title deed was found until Lord Carnaby popped up there he hangs, found them quite unexpectedly in a disused periwig on the 13th of July, 1669. Well, he took possession, died, left ne'er an heir or a title deed, and ne'er an heir or a title deed was found until Dame Cherry quite unexpectedly found them on the 13th of July. 1769, in the stuffings of an old farthingale. Well, she died in 1782. And from then till three weeks in, the castle's been left up to the machinations of the devil and his evil goblins. Old legend, the weird woman be fulfilled, 
Then the legal descendant to the castle will come tomorrow morn with the title deeds in his grip and will throw you out back and back, his naked crop. I can spear an awful misfortune hanging over the house of hair, and I have no manner of doubt that it's associated with the dreadful legend of the wicked Dame Rachel de Bourne. with one misfortune with which the House of Tear is threatened. The probable loss of its housekeeper, Mistress McMotherly, ah! if she continues to fill my niece's ears with her abominable superstitions. And that is a misfortune, ma'am, with which the House of Tear will bear with Christian fortitude. Now go. I mean, go away with ye. Hey! Yes! Telling her what you ought to know to be true. Who was it that prophesied you lose two broad ships by fire and tempest last year? <laughs> Why? Mistress McMotherly. Who was it that prophesied you'd come down with the measles last fall? Why? Mistress McMotherly. And who was it that prophesied that a bonny young callant would come a courting Miss Rosa this week? Why, Mistress MacMotherly, and I'll say it, if I'm burnt to be, if I'm going to be burnt alive for being a warlock, I'll just say it. There's an uncopied misfortune hanging over ye, and it ain't associated with the loss of your old housekeeper, Maggie MacMotherly! <laughs> My dear Rosa, if you ever go into housekeeping, if. well, when you go into housekeeping, take care to ascertain that none of your domestics are gifted with the curse of second sight. That woman has been in my service for 30 years and has done nothing but prophesy misfortune from the day she entered until now. And what's worse, all of her predictions come true. What was it she said about a bonny young gallant coming a courting Miss Rosa? Oh, I'm certain I have no idea what she could have been referring to. No one has been here except for Mr. Columbus Hevelthwaite. Uh ah, I believe, miss, she referred to him. Uncle, I'm certain I don't know what you're talking about. He has always been very agreeable, but nothing more. Well, it's as well we should have a distinct understanding on this point. I have noticed that that impoverished young man is unpleasantly marked in his attentions towards you. And I've noticed, instead of discouraging his penniless address, you have afforded him fifty means of persecuting them while in his residence with us for a week in this castle. He courted himself upon us without invitation, but, thank goodness, I have got rid of him at last. Uncle, how could you be so unkind? Oh, cry away, my dear. It is satisfaction enough to know that at this moment he is careening away at the rate of 60 miles an hour home to his native London. Let's see, it is now half past 11. The express left at 10.15, which means he is carry the one. Ha! Exactly 75 miles away from his beloved Rosa, and by a remarkable coincidence, his beloved Rosa is precisely the same distance away from him. What was that? I think it was someone knocking at the door. Columbus, my dear, thy knock I hear with mingled hopes and fears. It's murmur white waves with Eddying waves, the portals of my ears. Ah, you're trembling. I'm sure you know who's knocking at my gate. Take this out of the way! Give me the rebel swing! <laughs> Here's the door, Jasper. Very good, sir. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good evening, Mr. Hamilton. Ah, hello, Jasper. <laughs> Mr. Hamilton, how lovely to see you again. Welcome back. Ah, hello, Miss Rosa. Uh, Sir Ebenezer. Mistress McMotherly. <laughs> what a nice surprise to see your cheery face in this dismal place, sir. Uh, 
May I take your bag? Uh, yes, please. Pebble point. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> what in God's name are you doing here? You went away and spoke of not returning. Well, it's very clear he's come back here. For Mistress Bell's a bunny. For Mistress Bell's a bunny. What? Um, permit me a short explanation. <laughs> uh, you see, I left your manor earlier and thought I was not to return. Mm -hmm. However, by the time I arrived at the station, I was running so incredibly late that I had not a moment to look to see where I was going. After I eagerly grabbed my ticket from the booth and set off towards the train in the fury of my running eye, I took quite a fall. Oh, how terrible, Mr. Hebblethwaite. Are you okay? Thank you for your concern, my dear Rosa. I'm quite fine. My ticket, unfortunately, was caught in a gust of wind and landed in a place no proper gentleman would dare retrieve it. How dreadful. It landed in the train tracks. No. No? You see, there was a rather large woman sitting nearby, and the ticket, well, it landed between her... between her... Oh! <coughs> I see. And being too much of a proper English gentleman, I couldn't dare bother the poor woman to retrieve it. By the time I obtained a duplicate copy, oh horror, oh horror, I fell to the earth, for it was only too plain that the train was headed off to the land of my birth. Oh, poor oh, Mr. Hepplethwaite. Such a hideous strain of bad luck, eh, Rosalind? <laughs> bad luck indeed. Does this mean, sir, that you'll be staying for the night? <laughs> oh, I am certain we could house dear Mr. Hebblethwaite after such a horrible accident. What say you, Uncle? Uncle! Uncle, you must say something to the man. Poor fellow! Say? What can I say? Well, a few words, of course, that you missed him and so on. But I am not! Never mind. Pretend you are. Leave it to me. Mr. Hebblethwaite, my uncle wishes for me to tell you that he is delighted at the fortunate accident that has procured him the opportunity to see you again. My dear sir. And that he wishes you to consider his house your home until tomorrow evening. Until tomorrow evening? <laughs> until tomorrow week, if you'd like. But I say, Rosa. And that he would have told you this himself, but he thought it would come more prettily from my mouth. Oh, that it does, that it does! My dear sir, the warmth of your welcome overpowers me. But I say, sir, Rosa, go to bed. But, Uncle! Go to bed, miss. We will talk about this tomorrow. Go. Good night, Columbus. Good night, Rosa. Well, sir, as it seems my niece has given you to understand that I am extremely glad to have you back again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I know you are. I said nothing of the kind. As I said, my niece has expressed as much, and I am put to the disagreeable necessity of echoing her opinion. So, Jasper, if you'll take his candlestick, Mistress McMotherly will show you to your room. The room, Mistress McMotherly, is in the roof where the rats are. <laughs> Good night. And pleasant dreams to you. Yeah. Come along, sir. I hope you ain't afraid to go, and such. Uh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know them. What extraordinary costumes. 
They are all strangers to me. They were not there when I died. <sighs> died? Then I'm dead. I'm sure I died. And yet, here I am, walking about in my own picture gallery. Then I suppose I'm a ghost. My own ghost. <laughs> I wonder if I should be frightened. But I wonder who has the castle now. The deeds disappeared the day before I died in accordance with the wicked compact by which Dame Rachel de Beaume obtained possession of this castle 150 years before me. And by same, same accordance, the deeds would remain gone for the next 80 years after my death. Then at least 80 years have passed because evidently this castle is occupied. I wonder how my picture is kept. It was painted many years before my death by Leonardo da Vinci, a rather clever young artist. He tried to have it put in the Royal Academy, but he didn't know anybody on the hanging committee, so he didn't get it in. <laughs> Let me see, where did it hang? Why, this is the very gown I was painted in and my jewels, exactly as I wore them. What an extraordinary coincidence. But I came down from that picture just now. I distinctly remember coming down from that frame. And then I'm only a picture. Well, I'm glad I'm not a ghost. If I was, I would have done Messer Leonardo da Vinci a very serious and just there's another picture of me here, and it moves. Stop. <laughs> I remember. It's a mirror. I saw one once when I was quite a little girl. It was sent all the way over from Venice and cost a mint of money. How exceedingly foolish to leave such a valuable object just lying around. Let's see. I am looking. Rather well, well, quite the likeness, quite a speaking likeness. <laughs> I wonder who these other pictures are. Dame Cherry Maybud. <laughs> Lord Poppy Top. Oh, how perfectly charming. <laughs> such poise, such expression, such color, and there's a flesh tint. Dignity. I wonder who painted it. Michael Angelo. Hmm. Never heard of the fellow. Quite an unknown man. After all, on looking at it again, it's really quite a fourth or fifth rate production. Very tricky. Date 1602. Oh, whoa. Some mistake. They must mean 1502. I died in 1500. But I should really like to know of whom this is a portrait, for of all of its faults, there really is quite a manly dignity about it that must have been strongly imposed on by the original. You are very handsome. Very, very handsome. I'm lucky you're only a picture, for if you were a real man, I should be obliged to be rather particular. But as it is, you may say whatever I like to you. A sweeter fate I've never heard. My gratitude you've earned. My goodness me, he's talking. The compliment upon my word was very neatly turned. My goodness me, he's walking. I never thought you were alive. I thought you were a painting. I am indeed, and so are you. How do you know that? How do I know it? Why, didn't you hang here during the ten years I occupied this castle? Did you occupy this castle for ten years? I did indeed. And how do you know I'm not the original of whom that is a portrait? Because there's a limit to the beauties of nature, but no limit to the beauties of art. In other words, my dear, you are too good to be true. Angels are not half as bright as they are painted, and the famous Leonardo da Vinci was a terrible flatterer. <laughs> famous? Why, he was a mere nobody who painted me for a few pounds. Ah, but after your melancholy decease, <clears throat> pardon my alluding to such a distressing topic, he grew in fame and fortune, and by the time of his death, Europe rang with his fame. Now, 
I'd say you're worth at least 2,000 pounds. Is it possible? And you? I'm a Michelangelo. A fine example painted by him five years before I came quite uninspectedly into possession of this castle, and six years before his death. I'm worth at least as much as you. Indeed, I'm a much finer picture. <laughs> Sir! I am indeed. Look here. <laughs> here is drawing. You are the work of an artist. I am the work of an accomplished autonomist. How can you say so? Look at that hand. Look at its color. Look at its drawing. Ah, uh, yes. That is a rather sore point with me. You see, my hand was recently restored by a royal academician. I have only one hand, and this is not mine. <laughs> oh, Sir Cecil, please pardon my thoughtless remark. Believe that I had no intention of hurting you, and that I sympathize deeply with your pain. Your sympathy more than reconciles me to it. Besides, I can use it freely enough. <laughs> it was a little awkward at first, but I've become quite used to it. So I've spent years in this castle, Sir Cecil Blount, and never knew it. Yes, I spent ten years under that delicious gaze. I wonder if he's married. Really, if I had been Lady Blount, I wouldn't have allowed it. Lady Blount? My mother? No, your wife. Oh, I never had a wife. I thought not. Shall I tell you a secret? The reason I never married is because I have fallen desperately in love with you. With me? Oh, goodness. I'm quite serious. You see, I used to sit under your portrait for ten long years, smoking and vowing to myself I would never marry another till I found your equal. Maud, I used to say, my own Maud. You are mine, you know, together with everything else in this castle. My own Maud. I love you with my whole heart and soul. I love you with the devotion of a lover who knows his happiness is on the eve of being crowned, and with the desperation of a lover who knows there's not the remotest chance of anything of the kind. Sir, you are too bold. One may say what one likes to a picture, you know. All day I used to stare at those eyes, those cheeks, those lips, and dreamt them all night. I was just remarking before you revived that I fear my lips have lost all their color. Indeed, I fancy I can almost see the canvas through them. Ah, uh, that is not the famous Leonardo da Vinci's fault. It's mine. For you see, for ten years, night and day, I was in the habit of covering them with kisses. Sir! One may do what one likes to a picture, you know. But had I the least idea that we would ever meet under these particular circumstances, why, I would have never ventured on such a liberty. Well then, I suppose I must pocket my indignation. Besides, remember, after all, it was not I, but my prototype. Yes, of course. You can't be held responsible for everything that he did. So, say no more about it. Let's shake hands. With pleasure. Uh, no, the other one. I beg your pardon. Am I quite forgiven? Quite. A portrait, after all, is not, is not like its original. Very often it is not. One may say what one likes to a picture. You allow that? Yes. Anything. You said a hem. I said a hem. Oh goodness, who are you? I am Lord Carnaby Poppytop. How do you do? Sir, what is the meaning of this outrage? 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 You just kissed the lady. I did. <laughs> and by what right do you take such a liberty? Why, she's my great 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 grandmother. <gasps> To nonsense, you're old enough to be her father. Because I was painted at the age of 65. Lady Maud was painted at the age of 22. I was not born until 175 years after Lady Maud's death. And, speaking of liberties, 
By what right does my Michelangelo put his arm around the waist of my Leonardo da Vinci? <sighs> we, sir, are companion portraits. And by what right do you interfere with the proceedings of your great-great-great-grandmother? She's my painting. I may do with her what I like. She's your great-grandmother, sir, and she res deserves the respect and dignity due to one of her extraordinarily old age. <laughs> Besides, who are you? I don't know you. Ha! I am Lord Carnaby Poppytop, painted by Sir Godfrey Neller in 1713 at the age of 65. And... 44 years after coming into possession of this castle. <laughs> Sir Godfrey Neller, no one ever heard of the man. No one would have heard of you either if you hadn't been painted by an old master. Gentlemen, pray don't quarrel on my account. My dear, your grandmama is quite capable of taking care of herself. If there's any question as to whom you all belong, I believe I can set it at rest, Lord Carnaby. Ah, you know me then. Perfectly. Mm. You are Lord Carnaby Poppytop, who came quite unexpectedly into possession of this castle on the 13th July, 1669. You died in 1716, and the castle remained uninhabited and unclaimed until I, Dame Cherry Maybud, quite as unexpectedly, came into possession of the title deeds and entered the property accordingly. Now, allow me to settle the question that you were discussing before I interfered. You will abide by my decision? With, With pleasure. pleasure. Very well, then. You, Lady Maud, are clearly the property of Sir Cecil Blount, the gentleman who succeeded to the property after your death. Have you any objections to that? None whatsoever. Cecil, I'm yours. By that same rule, you, Sir Cecil, and you, Lady Maud, are both the property of Lord Carnaby Poppytop, who, after Sir Cecil's death, succeeded to the property and all that it contained. <laughs> uh, but I protest. Oh, it is useless, sir. You two are clearly my property, and a man may do what he likes with his own. Uh, Lady Maud, you come with me. Sir Cecil, stay there. Lady Maud, I think I shall marry you. Oh, you, Sir Connerby Poppytop! It's impossible! Lady... Dame Cherry, please be careful how you make your reward! Oh, my valued Leonardo da Vinci, expostulation is useless. This marriage is out of the question, sir! It is out of the question, sir! It is impossible, sir! Why? Why? Because! A man may not marry his grandmother. I think it is unnecessary to discuss that at present. <coughs> Let me continue. We have decided that Lady Maud belongs to Sir Cecil, and that Sir Cecil and Lady Maud both belong to Lord Carnaby Poppytop. It follows, therefore, that Lady Maud, Sir Cecil, and Lord Carnaby Poppytop all belong to me. You? Yes, to me. You are all mine. And as Lord Carnaby Poppytop says, I can do what I like with my own. <laughs> now, I'm going to dispose of my property. Lord Carnaby, let the young people alone. Sir Cecil, take Lady Maud. And if I refuse? If you refuse, my lord, my course is clear. I shall sell you to the nation. You will be hung up in the National Gallery, where no one will come to see you, and you will spend an ignominious existence in the society of sham Rubenses, fictitious Raphaels, and other impostors of every degree. <laughs> they won't buy me. I'm genuine. <laughs> you think so? Don't be so sure of that. If you don't take care, I'll have you so restored, there won't be a trace of the original work. Settling all this very coolly and comfortably, but doesn't it occur to you that it is a matter in which I am entitled to be consulted? 
You? And who in the world are you, sir? I am no other than the maternal grandfather of the present possessor of this castle, Mr. Alderman Tear. Uh, who are you by? I don't know. When were you painted? I was finished yesterday and hung up yesterday afternoon. Oh, you're a dreadful job. I'm afraid I am, but that's not my misfortune. It's not my fault. We don't paint ourselves, you know. Are you considered like? Like, like who? Why, like, like who? Like, like Mr. Alterman Terry's maternal grandfather, of course. <laughs> What's this the man like? How dare you laugh in my face, sir? Explain yourself. I insist upon it. My dear fellow, don't excite yourself. But the question was really so absurd that you must excuse my merriment. <laughs> like his maternal grandfather. My dear friend, Old Tear never had a maternal grandfather. Never had a maternal grandfather? Never had a grandfather of any kind, whatever. And what is more? He never will have. Oh, this is absurd. Then who are you? I tell you, I'm the portrait of Old Tear's maternal grandfather. But well, bless the man. You say he never had a maternal grandfather. Never. Well, what has that got to do with it? Then you are an imposter, sir. Not at all. Or if I am, we all are. Explain yourself. With pleasure. Tear says I'm his maternal Grandfather. Mm -hmm. But you know you're not. Of course. Then you're lending yourself to an imposter. A painting with any sense of decency would have rubbed himself out rather than be party to such an imposition. But Tear's assurance doesn't stop there. He says you're his great-great-grandmother and you his great-great-great Great grandfather! Oh, he does! It's monstrous! What an infamous fabrication! I never had any family at all! And I died a spinster. Mm. But Tan mm. declares it's true! But we know it to be false. Then rub yourself out without any loss of time. A picture with any sense of decency would take steps rather than be a party to such an oh, I'll teach you to bandy words with me! Come out, sir! Come out! <laughs> I can't! Why not? I'm not trying! I might rob! Coward! But who can expect nobility from such a misshapen frame? Oh, my shame! My frame is very good! Very good indeed! Well made and solid! A good piece of work. I'm alluding to your body, sir, <gasps> not <gasps> your setting! Oh, that <laughs> Job, I know, but he can't help that. Besides, you mustn't quarrel in the presence of a lady. You won't, I know. Won't I? No! You won't. Not if I ask, prettily. <laughs> you won't, you won't, you won't. Now, will you? No. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Miserable signboard, your life is spared. <laughs> but but where, where did they go? Who? Sir Cecil and Lady Maud. Oh, there they are. In the oh, oh, it's oh, so very disgusting, you know. <laughs> so young, yet so lost in all sense of propriety. I shall go call them back. So reflect one moment. They are two or three hundred years older than we are. Would it be Delicate to interfere? It is a rather delicate point. Are we to judge of their age by their years or by their personal appearance? <laughs> what can be? If you judge a lady's age by her personal appearance, there's no end to the amount of mistakes you'll make. <laughs> Just be content with the fact that they're older and let them be. I suppose there's no alternative, huh? Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, oh, I say he's, he's, oh. Let's them. Young people will be young people. Dina said, Dina said they were old people. Well, if they're old, then there's no fools like old ones. If they're young, we've been young too. If they're old, we've no rights to interfere. Besides, it's 
no business of ours, anyway. You know, we've been young, but we hadn't been young together. If we had. If we had, I dare say, we would have made ourselves very ridiculous. Now sit down and let them alone. Would we have made ourselves very ridiculous? Very, very ridiculous? <laughs> I don't know. I was very thoughtless and extremely pretty. Well, I was very thoughtless and remarkably handsome. Oh, age works wonders. <laughs> Now, there is a portrait of myself at the age of 19. Exquisite! And there I am at age 22. Perfect. Um, I say, I don't mean to be rude, but wouldn't it have been pleasanter for, uh, all parties if that Dame Cherry came to life instead of this one? Oh, <laughs> very good. Shall I go back up to my frame and send her down instead? Oh, please do, please do. You won't be offended. It's still you, you know, only younger and prettier. <laughs> offended? Oh. Not a bit. <laughs> only. Yes? If Dame Cherry at 19 is to take the place of Dame Cherry at 56, I think it's only fair to want Lord Carnaby at the age of 23 to take the place of Lord Carnaby at the age of 65. Ah, and do you insist upon that? Oh yes, I insist upon that. Dame Cherry at 19 would have nothing to say to an old gentleman like he. <laughs> Don't you think she would? No, she wouldn't. She wouldn't hear of it. Oh. <laughs> well, am I to gather that this Dame Cherry at age... Fifty-six! Oh, impossible! Say, thirty-five. That this Dame Cherry at age thirty-five would hear of it. Oh, Lord Carnaby! <laughs> oh! Hmm. Oh! Oh! Oh, oh Lord Carnaby! Oh. 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 Bully! Oh, oh. 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 good! I say, I don't want to interfere, but uh, really, you know, uh, before a third party, uh, you shouldn't. You shouldn't, indeed. Turn around, sir, and look the other way. <laughs> By all means. What will this do? Capitally. Now stay like that until I tell you to turn around, or I'll rub you out. <laughs> Oh, she's all faster. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. Yes. yes, yes! <laughs> then, there is only one thing to be done, and that is to ask the sanction of our marriage of our respected elders. <laughs> Ah, here they come. There is but one duty which we owe our venerable relations, that we ask their consent to marriage. Ah, here they are. Uh, what's this? Uh, we were about to ask your consent. To what? My marriage with Lady Maud. But we, but why ask our consent? Because you're a holder's relative. Ah, uh, but we were going to ask your consent. To what? To my marriage with Dame Cherry. But why? Because you're my great-great-grandfather. You are our ancestors. But we're your property. Ah, but I don't... Allow me to arrange this. You are all Alderman Tear's property, whose representative I am. Allow me to act for him and bestow the necessary blessings. <laughs> with with pleasure. pleasure. Then... Bless you, my ancestors. Oh, hooray. Oh, now that's comfortably settled. Oh. But goodness me, the sun is about to rise in a few moments where we'll all have to return to our respective frames for 100 years. <laughs> and I declare we've been forgetting the very purpose for which we've been revived. The title deeds! The title deeds! <laughs> I declare the next lineal descendant to be <gasps> Mr. Cal
Columbus Hebel Prince, who is stooping in this very house at this time. Wonderful. Oh, Columbus is in love with that lonesome Ted's lovely niece. Oh, and this good fortune will certainly function as a way to bring them two together. Oh, to love for real. Okay. I shall set these here, where they shall discover them upon descending to breakfast. There. The spell has been broken and may not be revived for 100 years. 100 years. morning and Mr. Hebblethwaite starts at six. It's little of Miss Rosa he'll be seeing this morning. But what's this? Abstract of title of Columbus Hebblethwaite to Glen Kakaliki Castle. But what does it mean? Columbus Hebblethwaite, owner of Glen Kakaliki Castle, Sir Ebenezer cannot know of this, surely. Here, Sir Ebenezer, Mistress McMotherly, and Miss Rosa. Mr. Hebblethwaite, come here. Oh, goodness me, what is all this shouting what about? What you making all that noise about, you noisy loon? It's the house of fire. Have you finally found your senses, which is? Ah, uh, my senses, I found more than my senses. Look here. Abstract of title of Columbus Hebblethwaite to Glen Kakaliki Castle. I found it on the table just this minute. Oh. Then the legends come true. Uh, uh, what's going on? Well, sir, it appears as though the hundred years expired this very day. And the real lineal descendant to the castle has shown himself to be none other than Mr. Columbus Oh, wow. Columbus, Glen Kakaliki Castle is yours. You're a poor man no longer. No, uh, it's impossible. It's, it's absurd. Uh, the documents are quite authentic, sir. It's the legend, Uncle. Mrs. McMotherly was right. <laughs> I'll dispute what? it. Uh, now stop a bit. There's no point disputing it. I'll make a bargain with you. If you consent to my marriage with Rosa, then you shall stoop here as long as you like. Columbus! What do you say? Shall we all live together? Well, sir, it appears that these are authentic, and it seems that you legally have the title to this castle. And in that case, I say I shall have no objection to entertaining your proposal to Rosa. Thank you, sir. You are too kind. <laughs> there leaves only one question left to be asked. My dear Rosa, will you marry me and make Glen Kakaliki Castle our home? Columbus! <laughs> <laughs> it's about time something good's come out of that wicked witch's curse. Oh, I knew those two would end up together. It is the benefit of second sight, you know. <laughs> Oh, off you go, lovebirds. What an old Jasper we have a wedding to prepare for! <laughs> I'll show you to your room, sir. It happens to be in the roof. We're the rats Ha, 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 ha.